All right, this evening I'm going to preach a sermon entitled The Tale Bearer. The Tale Bearer. And we read about this in Leviticus chapter 19 for the very first time, uh, reference to the tale bearer. And we're going to see what the scripture has to say about that specifically. And there's, uh, this is one of the things that, uh, it's a problem that, that's a sin that's associated with our tongue, right? And we're going to look at, at James later and, and see how the tongue is described. But, you know, sins with your mouth and your tongue are probably some of the easiest things to do. And there's many sins that we could commit with our tongue. There's lying, there's backbiting, there's gossiping, there's tailbearing, there's all these different things that people can do. And your words are really powerful. And the impact and the damage that can be caused by words is tremendous. And we need to keep this under consideration always. Um, and, and as the Bible says, I don't even know this in my notes, but that we ought to be uh, slow to speak and slow to wrath. And, you know, the, the fool is known by as much speaking. And, and as, as Christians and as believers, it's important just in all things to remember it's better to keep your words few. <laughs> just, I mean, you, you want to have a good guideline for your life. Just always remember it's better just to not speak as much. Right? Say the thing. I'm not saying just, just take a vow of silence or something and, and never speak again. But just be mindful if you keep letting your gums flap, there's a lot greater likelihood that you'll end up being in sin. Okay? And, and this is most likely to happen when you're just talking for the sake of talking and, you know, you just need something to talk about. And sometimes juicy things come up and you just want to talk about it because... Oh, it's so interesting, all of these things. I mean, this is why the tabloids are always so popular and why they're in business and why they sell so much, because people like to hear juicy things. And there's definitely people who want to talk about juicy things. But without going too far off into the world and those other things, let's just see what the Bible says about this. We started off reading Leviticus chapter 19. And in this section of Leviticus, we're going to read in context verses 13 through verses 18. And in this passage, in verses 13 through 18, it talks a lot about your neighbor. So this is going to be how you would be dealing just with the people that are close to you. Obviously, we can apply this to brothers and sisters in Christ. But even just in general, um, you know, doing good unto your neighbor, loving your neighbor as yourself, this all falls into how you would love your neighbor as yourself. So let's start reading in verse number 13. The Bible says, Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. Right? Being deceitful to your neighbor, doing things that would, uh, you know, by fraud, you're, you're, you're putting something up, you're being deceitful, you're lying about it in order to get money out of him, the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. So if you, if you hire someone for work, you're not supposed to withhold their wages. You, you know, they work for you that day, you're supposed to pay them that day. And that's what the Bible teaches, by the way. I know we live in a different culture, different society, and that doesn't happen very often, but it's the right way of dealing with they, this. And the whole point is especially for people who, who don't live, who don't have a bunch of wealth or abundance, that, hey, if they do the work, give them their money. They need that money right away. They work for you, you pay them. Right. And of course, we're built in a way that's a lot better for the corporation than it is for the individual. Right? It's a lot easier for the corporation to give out paychecks, you know, once or twice a month and, and, and do all their accounting that way and stuff. But that's not better for the employee. Right. It's better for the employee to have your money right away. And I'm not going to go into all the economics about that. Uh, it doesn't take an economist to understand that concept. But um, this is how, how the Bible says those things ought to be done. But I'm not going to spend time on that. Let's keep reading. Uh, Thou shalt not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shalt fear thy God, I am the Lord. Again, mistreating people who have disabilities. Uh, verse 15, you shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge Thy neighbor, and this is important, this is the verse preceding the one that we're going to spend more time focusing on, is not being a respecter of persons, right? So our judgment ought always to not depend on who a person is. Always. It doesn't matter who a person is. 
the judgment is the same. It should be equal. And we ought to strive for this always, okay? To not just elevate or lift up someone above what a righteous judgment ought to be. And that goes for, for both sides of the coin, okay? And, and before I even get started, I just want to make sure no one has in their head, I, I am not for sweeping things under the rug, as it were, uh, at least when it comes to big deals. And what you're going to see as we get into the scripture is that there's, the Bible teaches you that something, some secrets ought to just be concealed, but other things obviously should come to light. That there is, there is a difference in the, the subject matter or whatever it is that happens or whatever information you come across. Some things ought to be exposed. Simple examples, right? And we could go through examples all day trying to find, well, where is that line? Okay, and the line's not always going to be easy to know. But essentially, I would say, you know, Anything that ought to be reported, like some criminal activity, things like that going on, that, look, that's not being a tail bearer when there's like that type of wrong going on. Just simple, easy example, for example, some predator or something, right? Like, and this is what happens in churches, but then they try to cover it up and, and, and just say, oh, no, we're going to deal with this internally, and then they just move people around and shuffle them around. Instead of like dealing with the predator, dealing with the person, who's done, you know, serious wrong. Like, no, absolutely. They, they ought to be punished. They ought to be brought to justice, right? You don't cover those types of things up. But at the same time, imagine what a world we would live in if any time anyone ever did anything wrong, you just had a bunch of people talking about it and, tell, you know, and, and reporting you and everything else, right? So obviously there's a balance, Obviously, there's some things that we ought to be talking about and some things that we shouldn't. And we're going to get into more details here. We're going to read the scripture specifically and find this out. But first of all, that, that no unrighteousness and judgment is important. And, and here's what I mean by that. So there's, there's two sides of this coin. On the one hand, you can have someone who's really popular and really well-liked, right? And when either information comes out or an accusation is made or something like that. Here's the thing. Just because everyone likes that person doesn't mean that they automatically aren't guilty of whatever it is if there's some accusation or something like that, right? So you can't just take the side just automatically just saying like there's absolutely no truth. Like if you don't know, right, and, and you haven't heard any facts and it's just like some accusation, you just know like no, that's not true. The facts would have to be presented to be able to speak for themselves. And even if you like someone, and even if someone has a good reputation, if the facts are all there, right, you still make the right judgment and say that this is, this is appropriate, this is correct, this is the truth, right? Because it's the truth that matters. Now, of course, especially, and, and if we apply this, you know, spiritually and the churches and things like that, we already know there's going to be a lot of attacks on men of God. Right? So we kind of get used to that because people will come and lie and slander and say all manner of evil against people falsely for, for, because people are serving Christ. So that happens a lot. So you got to be aware of that and obviously use some discernment. And, and there is a reason to give credibility to people who have tr proven themselves to be honest and trustworthy and things like that. However, if, if when it comes to making a judgment call, uh, you're going to give someone, the, here's the thing, you give people the benefit of the doubt when there's doubt, but when there's clear evidence and, and you have all the facts, then you can't be a respecter of persons in the judgment, right? So, so simply we see, we see oftentimes in the political arena, people getting off of, of being, even just being charged with crimes, right? We see, we see that happening even today politically, right? There's, there, and, and look, before I even speak, I am not a Republican or a Democrat, okay? I don't like either party, um, and, and I'm, not, I'm not planning on voting for anybody. You know, you do whatever you want to do in this election, 
because there's nobody running that I want to cast a vote for. That all being said, and this is not a political sermon, it's easy to see that like when, when Donald Trump is getting charged for having classified documents at his residence, but then like, Joe Biden does the ex literally the exact same thing, and Hillary Clinton does the exact same thing, just like to a T, like, like it's exactly the same. Oh yeah, no charges here, charges here. That's being a respecter of persons, because the person that you like, you don't want to charge them, but the person you don't like, they, them you do want to charge, right? Now, that's just like an easy example to see about not being a respecter of persons. And this is talking about, you know, whether they're poor, whether they're rich. So, you know, all these different things, they shouldn't matter. We should always just be seeking out a righteous judgment. And here's the thing. That's, that's the only way that we can continue with integrity and honesty as we preach the word of God and as we serve Christ to be able to still have respect of people is when you deal with things honestly and appropriately. And if there's judgment to be had and judgment to be made, then it is done appropriately. Now, there's things that happen outside of our scope of just judgment in general and areas where we might not ever have all the proper information and facts to make a proper judgment. And you also need to know when to Say, I don't have all the facts, and I don't know what, you know, how, how to judge this without knowing everything, and if it's outside of my wheelhouse, then I'm just going to have to leave it at that, especially on things that don't matter as much, right? Now, the, the serious information and the more serious, like, you, if you're involved and, it's, and it impacts us or impacts you, then that's different than things that just happen in other places, other areas, there's other problems, other people's jurisdiction to deal with, right? I know I'm kind of saying a lot and I'm bouncing around a little bit, but um, all of this is important for understanding the tailbearer. So that was verse 15. We didn't even get into the tailbearer yet. Verse 15 is talking about being honest in judgment, or excuse me, in, 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 yeah, in judgment. And then um, verse 16 says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a tailbearer among thy people. Neither shalt thou stand against the blood of thy neighbor. I am the Lord. And, you know, going up and down as a tail, but what's a tail bearer? It's someone who is bearing tails. There's no word for tail, it's a story, right? Now, a story could be true or it could be false. This isn't only referring to things that are false, being a tale bearer. It's not just telling stories about things that just simply aren't true and making things up. And I can prove that to you because we can, we'll look at other, and in fact, if you want to turn to Proverbs 11, I'll, I'll, I'll just prove that to you right now, that the definition for tale bearer is not only somebody who's saying things that are false. That's more like a railing accusation. Railing accusations are more tied to people say, accusing people falsely of things. But a tail bearer is someone who goes around and starts telling stories to people. And this is in the context of Leviticus 19. I'm going to read the next couple of verses for you. Verse 17 says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. Again, that's tied right in with the verse preceding that about not being a tail bearer among thy people. And when people do things that are wrong, look, if you're wronged by someone... You shouldn't be a tail bearer and go around telling everybody about the wrong that they did to you. If you have a problem with someone, you deal with that someone with that problem, right? I mean, it makes sense. You're not supposed to hate your brother in your heart. Your brother or sister does you wrong. You don't hate them. You rebuke them. Hey, you did me wrong, right? Confront them and rebuke them when they're wrong and tell them that they're wrong. But matters that happen between two people, how is that anyone else's business? It's not. It's not anyone else's business. There's no reason to go around and start telling stories about, do you know what so-and-so did? That's what a tale bearer is. You're telling stories about people. 
the Bible's teaching us, hey, first of all, be righteous in your judgment, right? Don't be a respecter of persons. Don't go up and down as a tail bearer and look, don't hate your brother in the heart, but rebuke him. And then verse 18 says, thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. All of these things are applicable to the tail bearer and all the damage that gets caused by tail bearers and people who end up forming grudges and, and, and pitting, being pit against people because of the stories that you hear or the stories that you tell and the damage that's inflicted all through the mouth. Now, obviously, Leviticus 19 is, is a lot more application, but you can see how they still all fit together with the tail bearer um, being grouped together in this, in this section. Look at Proverbs 11, verse number 12. The Bible says, He that is void of wisdom despiseth his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Holding your peace is another way of keeping quiet. So what, what it means. You hold your peace, right? This is what, what my kids kind of like this, but when uh, I, don't like, I don't like saying shut up, right? It happens sometimes, and I don't like hearing my kids say shut up. It's just kind of rude. So we taught them to say, hold your peace. <laughs> <laughs> and they get a kick out of that, and, it, and, and it, actually, it actually works out. I think it's a, it's a better way of saying it. But the Bible says here that a, a man of understanding holds his peace, right? You, you don't say anything. And, uh, but it says, he that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor. Notice how that's, those two go together. And Proverbs does this a lot, where it's like, wait, what, why does it say he despises his neighbor, but then it says he holds his peace? Because the one who despises his neighbor isn't holding his peace. Right? Like, like that's why those are, are, are put together like that. The one guy despises his neighbor. Why? Because he's talking, he's talking trash and he's talking about him. But the other one, the man of understanding, holds his peace. He doesn't say anything. And then verse 13 says, A tale bearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Now, clearly we can see that if a tale bearer is only talking about people saying false things, then why would it say a tale bearer reveals secrets? A secret is something that's true. A secret that's something that's kept between people, right? And a tale bearer reveals those things. So you're telling a story about something. But you're telling a story about something that's said in confidence. It's you're telling a story about something that, that maybe would have been shared with you, and now you're going to go around and start blabbing your mouth to everybody about it. And that's what a tail bearer does. And oftentimes a tail bearer does that just because it's just so interesting that you have to start telling people about it. But you don't, really. You just feel that way, right? In the flesh, you feel like you have to start talking about this. It says, but he that is of a faithful spirit, someone who's reliable and trustworthy, conceals the matter. And, and, and think about this. This makes sense. As I mentioned before, I'm not about, you know, big cover-ups and everything else, but doesn't it make sense that you can have someone you can confide in, and maybe, maybe you have a sin in your life that you're struggling with, and you want a brother or sister in Christ to be able to help you out and, and go to him and be like, man, I'm struggling with this and I don't know what to do. Can you help me out? And someone comes to you in that state or in that condition and they're revealing, they're opening up their heart to you and it's a secret that they have and it's not something they just want blasted abroad and they just want you to help them with them. Doesn't it make sense that you can conceal whatever that is while you're trying to help them through that issue and through that problem and that you can be faithful and not just start blabbing your mouth and talk, hey, did you know that so-and-so so, you know, is doing this or doing that? And this is just one example, but you see, we could e easily see how this makes sense. Right? How, how it does make sense sometimes not to talk about things. Right? And to keep that to yourself. And you come across information not to just go and, and just keep spreading and spreading and spreading and spreading. It makes sense. Now, I don't think that's the only time that you don't be repeating matters or, or spilling beans on things. But there is a difference. Uh, turn, if you go to Proverbs 18. We still do have to understand when is it appropriate to say something and when is it appropriate not to say something. Because there are times where you ought to be telling someone something about a secret. And, and the, the super most obvious example would be someone comes to you and is like, hey, I'm thinking about molesting children. 
uh, yeah, that's not something that's going to be kept secret. You know, like, hello. Or, you know, I, whatever, right? You, you, could, you, could, you, you understand what I'm talking about. The, the, some, big, it's like some big thing happens. Yeah, you, you know, we're not going to just stand by and pretend like I didn't hear that. I'm going to say something. Now, but here's the thing. What's appropriate? When, when there, there are times when you come across information that's important to be known, well, you should be sharing that with the people who can do something about that. Right? There still is no point necessarily in just talking to a whole bunch of other people that can't do anything about it. You need to deal with it. Right? In the appropriate manner. So if that's something, you know, if there's something that people are doing that, you know, and, and let's bring it home to church where there's, where there's people who are guilty of, say, like a 1 Corinthians 5 sin. Something that's, a, that's, that's worthy of getting you kicked out of church. Right? The Bible says that we're supposed to separate ourselves from that, that wicked person and that that's something that's like, it's really bad. And, and there ought to be a church discipline associated with that. Okay, so someone's guilty about, you know, I saw so-and-so stumbling out of the bar drunk and like, it wasn't just one night. I saw this happen multiple times, right? Now look, something like that happens. You don't just go and just start telling everybody at church that you saw that. Go to the pastor and say, hey, I, you know, I saw this. Because we still need to establish facts, right? One person just saying something you still got to establish the facts. You can't just base anything off of, of the testimony of one, one witness. So we'll do what's appropriate and, and, and figure out the facts of the matter, maybe confront the person or, or you know, see if, if we can if, see what, what's going on here. But there's no reason. Let's just say, you know, you saw someone stumble out of a bar and then you go around telling everyone else this story. And now everyone's got this bad opinion formed about that guy. And then you confront him and he's like, oh, yeah, you know, my, <laughs> my son was in there or whatever, right? Like, like there is a reason that's not that person getting drunk. And then like he trips over a rock or something. It looks like he's stumbling. And there's, there's like some valid explanation behind it. And you find out the truth of the matter. It's like, no, this guy's not a drunkard at all. It's a lot better to figure that out get to the facts and understand it before all of a sudden you've got everybody talking about it, right? And then if it turns out to be like, yeah, I mean, this guy's a drunkard or whatever, then you know what? We're going to execute this one and I'll announce to everybody and say, hey, here's what happened. Here's the facts. You know, this is, this is what went down and that's how it's dealt with. But see, that's appropriate. That's decent and that's in order. And, and obviously it's easy to, to, well, it's not always easy, but we talk about things in church context, but it, it goes beyond that. In, in general, you know, when, let's say it's a, if it's a lesser sin or something that people are doing, now you've got to ask yourself if there's no church discipline associated with that. Let's say, you know, here, we're, I'm against, you know, w listening to worldly music and like watching all this TV and, and, and consuming all the movies and stuff like that. But I'm sure there's probably people in here that watch that stuff and listen to that stuff. There probably are. So, so what? Do I think it's sinful? Yeah, I do. Smoking cigarettes, I think it's sinful. Okay, but that's not on par with a sin that's like worthy of someone getting kicked out of church. And as such, there's nothing that's going to be done about that. So I would ask you this, then what's the point of talking about that? What's the point about talking evil about somebody who's doing something they shouldn't be doing? What's the point of talking about that? What's the point, even if you oh, I know it, it's true. Okay, just because something's true doesn't mean you should talk about it. I mean, we always speak truth, okay? But just because something's true doesn't mean that you always just start talking about things. Well, it's true. I mean, hey, it's true. I'm just speaking the truth. Yeah, but it's not always appropriate. Yeah, yeah. It's not always right. You can't just say, well, it's true. Yeah, well, you know what? A talebearer isn't always saying false things either. But the Bible says that a talebearer reveals secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. 
Proverbs 18, verse number three. The Bible reads, when the wicked cometh, then cometh also contempt and with ignominy reproach. And, and again, I'm, get, I'm getting these in context as well. Because there's a lot of, of this of the, in this section of, of Proverbs 18 that is applicable to the talebearer. As we find in the context in many passages, you'll get a lot of supporting information to help you get a full, clear understanding of what the Bible is trying to teach us. Verse number four. So the wicked is being associated with contempt, right? You have contempt for people, you know, hatred um, is what's being brought up here in verse three, verse four. The words of a man's mouth are as deep waters and the wellspring of wisdom as a flowing brook. It is not good to accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. Now, when I brought up, when we looked at Leviticus 19, remember, it talked about doing, not being unrighteous in judgment and not accepting the person and, and whether they're poor, whether they're rich, you don't accept the person. But isn't this interesting? And I brought up not to just automatically side with the person that you like or the person who's popular. Maybe it would be a preacher. Maybe someone has a good reputation, but you'd have to still judge righteously. And this is now bringing up the other side of the coin. Okay, don't accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. And just because someone's saying something also doesn't make it true. And a wicked person has, uh, you know, it's like, oh, but, but this is so-and-so, whoever, accepting their person. Never accept the person of the wicked to overthrow the righteous in judgment. You know, you ought to stand by the righteous. And, and it doesn't matter who the wicked person is. You don't, you don't, you don't yoke up and, and join up with the wicked person in order to overthrow the righteous in judgment. And I've seen this happen a lot. Unfortunately, online, when someone gets a, a, a beef with someone, uh, with, with, you know, some pastor, someone doing a great work for God, and then people get, I don't know, rebuked, they, they get something happens they don't like, and then all of a sudden they're, they're jumping over to these people that hate that person, to the wicked people who are trying to destroy the work of God, destroy the good things that are going on, and then just start flapping their gums and talking about all the stuff. Oh, oh yeah, you want to interview me? Oh, you want to talk to me? Yeah, sure, I'll tell you all about them. Oh, I'm just telling the truth. Oh, yeah, I'll just tell you all about it. Let me just give you all the juice, all the things that you want to hear, everything that's going to be good at overthrowing the righteous in judgment. Verse 6 says, a fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calleth for strokes. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. And, and before I even go any further, God help the, the younger generations growing up today, because, you know, I was just talking to someone about this, and, and just over and over again, I just see, and, and, and you don't know how thankful I am that like the internet wasn't a thing when I was growing up. Okay, and everyone my age and older are going, amen. Because children, young people do foolish things. Really, really foolish things. But you know what? When you did things without the social media, without the internet access, without everything else, it would be forgotten. And not that many people would know about the foolish things you did other than the people who were kind of immediately around you. It wasn't broadcast for the world to see. And it wasn't just screenshotted and saved and being just, you know, able to be brought up over and over and over again. But that's how things are nowadays. And, and now more than ever, young people especially don't, you know, you, if you get nothing else from the sermon... Try to make your words few, especially 
what you're putting out online, who you're talking to, doing all this stuff, it will serve you well in the long run. Young people have, a, have a, a courage and a boldness, which is great about being young. It's one of the great attributes about being young and, 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 and willing to take risks and do these things. And, can help, and that can help a person to do a lot, of, a lot of great things and make great achievements by having a good spirit like that and, and being courageous and doing those things. But at the same time, can be very uh, uh, strong-willed into saying things that really aren't that wise <laughs> and, and end up saying a lot that, that don't make sense and, and their mouth can, can, you could end up saying foolish things that you just, it only takes a matter of a few years sometimes to look back and be like, what in the world was I thinking? Why did I say that? And again, b before you have everything just recorded and snapshots, like, yeah, you could say something stupid and be like, well, at least that wasn't that big of a deal. That was then and, and everyone's moved on, but now it's just like, it's gonna get thrown in your face, if nothing else. If you change your mind and, be, and, you, and you start to realize and gain some wisdom, like, like, wow, oh yeah, look, remember when you said this? <laughs> remember when you did that? Man, I do, I do not envy your position at all having to, to, to go through those years. But look, those that have wisdom also need to understand the errors of the youth, too, right? And, and show grace where, it's, where, where it needs to be shown as well. Let's keep reading here about Proverbs, in Proverbs 18 because this, this is serious about uh, the fool's lips entering contention, looking for fights. The fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. That's pretty, I mean, that's, that's a lot of damage you can see already. Uh, uh, for a fool's mouth doing. It's his, it's his own destruction and, and it's the snare of his own snow, soul. Excuse me. And then it says in verse 8, the words of a talebearer are his wounds and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. Talebearer does damage. And oftentimes, the talebearer doesn't even realize that they're doing the damage. They're just being a talebearer and, and revealing secrets and you know, some oftentimes not necessarily intentionally even realizing the damage that's being done. But it does a lot of damage. Uh, turn if you to Proverbs 26. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs 20:19. The Bible says in Proverbs 20:19, He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. And it's interesting that, it, that the two are tied together. So this tail bearer is someone who's an intentional tail bearer because they exist too. There's the unintentional tail bearer, which is probably most people that end up getting caught up in gossip and just talking about things just to talk about them just because it's, you know, whatever. It's, it's interesting. And then there's the tail bearer who intentionally is going about to, to reveal secrets. And that's why it warns about people who flatter with their lips. And, and really, it's kind of funny because a, a, a tail bearer, what, what, I mean, what are they doing? They're telling a story. They're bearing a story. It's like a news reporter in a sense. <laughs> now, I'm not saying all news reporters are evil. Right? There's obviously some information that's important for everyone to know. I mean, there's bombs falling somewhere here. Like, yeah, I mean, we ought to know about those things. You know, there's uh, someone's being convicted of a crime or something like that. Look, these are important. This is important information to know uh, what's going on with leaders and things like that, especially people who live public lives. It's going to be more important uh, to understand some of the things that are going on when it's truth and there's news being reported about things that uh, are happening. But... You don't need a news reporter for every individual in the world, <laughs> right? Going and digging up the scoop and digging up the story about everybody's lives. But the person who is an intentional tail bearer, they use flattery as a tool to soften people up. 
And, and I would say this, as there's continuing to be more and more social media and more and more people digging for dirt and trying to find out information, you know, watch out for the person who's going to talk to you so gently and want to, oh, oh, I want to be your friend and, and, and speak so nice to you and tell you things that you want to hear and flatter you just to gain your confidence so that you can end up saying things that you know, that you ought not to be talking about, that are, that are, ought to just be kept secret. That's no one else's business, but you and, and whoever else is involved with, with your knowledge. Proverbs 26 is where I had you turn. Look at verse number 20. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. Makes sense, right? We got a campfire. Hey, we ran out of wood. What's going to happen? The fire's going to go out. Common sense. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. The tail bearer brings conflict and brings strife and causes problems, right? There's, there's someone who, you know, does whatever, and that's between them and, and you know, that's their business. Then a the tail bearer comes along, and now all of a sudden you start having problems. Now all of a sudden you're starting to get fights. Now all of a sudden you're starting to get people picking sides and, and, and being split apart and doing things over what? Over what? Causing problems, causing fights. Verse 21, as coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a talebearer are as wounds and they go down to the innermost parts of the belly. That is exactly quote. We already read this verse. And it's a quoted again in Proverbs 26, 22. Obviously, uh, it's important to know. The words of a talebearer, they're like wounds. You're doing damage by being a talebearer. You think you're not hurting anyone, but you are. Burning lips and a wicked heart. A burning lips. I mean, that's just, you just can't help yourself but, but speak. And a wicked heart are like a potsherd covered with silver dross. Now, you say, a pot shirt covered with silver drop. What is that? It's good for nothing is what that is. A pot shirt is just a little fragment of, of a pottery, and the silver dross is the refuse of refining silver. It's the garbage that you, that you get rid of as you refine pure silver, the dross. So you, you've got two things that are just absolutely good for nothing. So you're trying to beautify something that's broken, that's of no value with dross. And that's what it says that the, the, the burning lips and the wicked heart are like. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. When he speaketh fair, believe him not, for there are seven abominations in his heart whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be showed before the whole congregation. Notice that too. So this is still, we're, we're talking about someone here that um, I believe is, is someone who's an intentional tail bearer and is causing problems. Their hatred is covered by deceit, meaning they're lying about it. They're going around and spreading stories but then they're going to lie about whoever they're talking about to, to conceal the fact that they're doing the damage to that person. But then it says, his wickedness shall be showed where? Before the whole congregation. This, this happens in churches all the time. It's sad, it's unfortunate, but it happens way too often. People start gossiping, people start talking, feelings get hurt. You get factions, you get cliques, you get people just banding together. And can you believe what this person said? Do you believe what that person says? And you, you know, and this, and you know what? It's getting easier and easier for that type of communication to continue with social media, with the text, with everything else that people can just talk so quickly and so easily. And you can say things so fast. You know, it's, it, it, it used to be where you, you could take, you know, and look, I'll, I'll, I'll confess to you what I do sometimes in my, in, in my professional life. Because I'm not immune to this either. 
And this is just, I'm just talking about reacting to things that you hear and what you might want to say at first. You need to put a filter and a sensor on, on your communication. Just a week ago, I received an email from someone who was upset over some issues and some problems that we had, and I had to send their way and kind of took it out on me and said some things that were kind of rude. Okay? No big deal. But I was a little bothered by that. So I start responding right away. But I don't hit send. I wait. I wait. And I wait intentionally. I just think about it a little bit. And I know better than to just react. It's taken a while, but I, I know better now than to just react. And then I, I looked at it, and, and there's one, there's two. And there's one instance I just didn't respond to at all. And there's another one where and a response was appropriate because of other people who were on the chain that I needed, to, I needed to say something because there were other people involved now in this discussion where a, a defense of myself was somewhat warranted. But the response was not uh, uh, trying to go back and forth. It was a measure to defuse the situation and just say, you know, thank you for your time and just kind of cleared up a couple of things where it would have looked like I was a source of the problem when I wasn't and just gave a good explanation without saying how I really felt. <laughs> Saying, no, saying how the flesh felt is more, is more correct. Okay, because when your pride gets hurt, you want to strike and lash out. But we have to be able to control it. Now, look, that's just, that's just a response, right? But when it comes to, to tale bearing and telling stories, look, it's very similar. You, you may come across information that for whatever reason, is interesting. And usually what's interesting is sin. Usually when people do things that they're not supposed to do, did you know what so-and-so did? Well, you have to ask, ask yourself this, and especially with people who you know or at least just have, you know, you know they're saved, you have every reason to believe that they're saved, they say or do something really stupid what really is the value of talking about and spreading things that just, it's none of your business, right? And, and, and think about it this way. If people do wrong, you can say, yeah, but that's wrong. I know. I know it's wrong. And people do, a lot of people do a lot of things that are wrong. And you do things that are wrong. And how would you feel if you just had everything that you do wrong published abroad and everybody knows about it and let's all start talking about this. Let's make videos about it and let's send it out and share it to everybody. Do you want that done about you? I don't want that done about me. Now, again, there are some times where you got, you got maybe a figure that, that has a lot of influence that Maybe they're a big hypocrite in some area that needs to, you know, something needs to be exposed, right? Or maybe someone needs to be marked and avoided because they're sowing discord or they're doing some other wickedness or, you know, they're doing something where the Bible's going to say, hey, mark and avoid these people. That's when it's appropriate to bring up something and be like, hey, I'm marking and avoiding this person because of this. But when, it's, when it falls below that threshold of something that's that serious, we need to be able to just not invest the time in, in participating in the tail bearing and the gossiping. And, and I mean that, you know, sincerely, it's not, I'm not, and don't think I'm trying to, you know, there's probably people out here right now are thinking like, I know exactly what Pastor Burns is talking about. No, you don't, because I'm not even talking about anything in particular. I'm talking about preaching the Bible. But the way that these things happen all the time, like you can say, I could preach this at any time, and you could say, I know why Pastor Burns is preaching this. 
Because there's always stuff going around because people are always talking trash no matter when it is. Seriously. So, we need to learn when that's appropriate when it's not and, and when we're just being tail bearers and just telling stories and, and when we're not, right? So, um, more often than not, you know, people are being tail bearers and we need to not... Um, not be involved in that. Uh, First Timothy chapter five. First Timothy chapter 5 is talking about, about widows and talk about widows who are widows indeed. And widows who are widows indeed are, are older women, women who have been found faithful, women who have been, you know, they wash the saints' feet, they lodge strangers, they, they serve God, you know, godly women, right? And, and they become a widow and they're like 60 years old or above. You know, these are widows or are widows indeed. And then it goes on to talk about the younger widows, okay? And it's, it's talking about women, Right? It's, not, it's not talking about men that are widowed. It's talking about women that are widowed and the church supporting those widows. And then it sa- but it says, in, it says in verse 11, it's comparing the younger against the older. It says, but the younger widows refuse. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. And with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. What he's teaching here is that, you know what, I'd rather, instead of the, the younger widows being cared for by the church and just being supported to where then they're going to have to do something with their time and they're going to end up getting involved in this type of idle sin, and, and, and doing these things, he says, it's better. I'd rather just have them. I want them just to get married then. Get remarried. Get married to somebody else. You're a widow. You're younger. Find another husband. Get married. Bear children. Guide the house. Keep yourself busy in those good, wholesome things so that they're not just being supported by the church because then they're going to be idle and they're going to have all this time on their hands to get involved in these type of sins where they're wandering from house to house and they're tattlers and busybodies. They're getting involved in everyone else's business. They're talking about all the stuff that's going on and all the gossip, right? And that's what happens, especially with women. Look, it's a fact that's just more prone a sin. It's more prone of women than it is of men to be doing these things. It's, it's just in the nature of women to be more likely to talk. But it doesn't mean that men can't commit the same sin. Because they absolutely can. We all need to be careful with our words. But especially be careful when you're idle that you don't find yourself just, I need something to do. I need something to talk about. And there's a reason why soap operas have been so popular for so long amongst women who are at home and have nothing else to do to watch soap operas. Why? Because there's drama. And it's juicy and people like drama. Okay? And, and I would say this, it's, if you have to have your drama fixed, that would be better than being the tail bearer and talking about other people's stuff and getting involved in other people's business. I don't think it's good to, to fill your mind with all the drama of soap operas, but that's way better in comparison to being than a tale bearer and a tattler and a gossiper and, and actually going around because, because that causes a lot more damage about people when you just go around and start talking about them. All right, I already, I'll, I'll mention, it's turn if you go to Ephesians 4. I'll read real quickly from James 3. It's a real popular passage. We, we all probably know it, but I'll, I'll read it anyways. James 3, 5 says, Even so, the tongue is a little member that boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. You get a lot of destruction, a lot of damage, even just from a little fire. The fire grows out of control real quickly and spreads into this big wildfire and then causes a tremendous amount of damage. Just a little fire can start that. And the tongue is a fire. 
The Bible says, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire of hell. And think about that. Your tongue is a fire that's, that's set on fire from hell. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Wow. Tell me how you really feel. <laughs> like, I, don't think you could, I don't think you could get any harsher about the tongue and the damage that it can cause, right? I mean, that's like, I, I couldn't come up with a better way of saying how damaging your tongue can be, right? And, and the things that you say and how powerful. And look, it makes sense because the words, like the word of God brings life. And us using our mouth and using our words can, can do so much good and can help people and benefit people so much and the encouragement and the edifying, the things that you can do can help people tremendously to the point of just bringing life through the gospel, right? All done through your words. Well, on the flip side, you can also do so much damage also by your words. It happens, right? So Ephesians 4, I'm going to close on Ephesians 4. This just tells us how we ought to speak, right? And, and kind of should give us that guideline of when should I be speaking, when should I not be speaking. Ephesians 4, 25, the Bible says this, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. There you go, I'm talking the truth. Right? I, well, I covered that earlier. Just because something's true doesn't mean you should always say it. But we should always be speaking the truth, right? Should we, we always should be truthful, but um, just because you're telling the truth doesn't mean that you're not a talebearer. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your... And you know what? Before I even go any further, I just want to say this. I don't know if this is, if this is a thing anymore, but it, it should be. It should be. When, when I was growing up, as a kid, you don't tattle on other people, right? My parents would say, don't tattle. My friend's parents would say, hey, don't be a tattler. I say that to my kid. Don't tattle on your sibling. Don't go tattling on people. Now, look, if, someone, if something like serious happens, you, you let me know about it, right? But someone does something wrong, don't be a tattler. One, nobody likes a tattler. Two, if it's your friend or your sibling, you should love them enough to not want to see them get in trouble and have you know, bad things happen to them because you're tattling on them, right? Be there for them, right? Be, be a brother to them, be a sister to them, be a friend to them and, and, and support them and not just go around tattling all the time. And that's, you know, when you're going around just tattling every little thing that people do, that ain't right. Like I said, then, then what if people just do that to you? That you always got to think about it that way. You want to go around and, and point out everybody's imperfections and everyone else's flaws, then what if, that, if, what if that was done to you? And, and you know, as a parent, I, I hate hearing the tattling. I think every parent hears it, but man, is that just annoying. Because there's things that's like, look, that doesn't even deserve a punishment. Like, like... Stop. Just leave it alone. You don't need to tattle on everything. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. And that's important too. Because we know, we know that the devil wants nothing more than to destroy those who are serving the Lord, destroy good churches, and destroy just people. Right? These, the devil's out to destroy let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. This is where the, the common American proverb, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all, comes from. It comes from a verse like this. This is... This is uh, more eloquent, right? But essentially is saying the same thing. Hey, look, we ought to be saying things that are good for edifying people, building people up, not tearing people down. 
right? And just, just don't confuse. Of course there's a time and a place when things need to be brought to light and, and need to be addressed publicly. But if it's not something that's this major sin and problem, and look, people are going to do what they're going to do, and I would just advise you this too. Just don't get involved. People are, are talking about things and being, you know, putting all this stuff out and being public. Just, I don't, I don't have any interest in that. I don't need to know all the, just need to know all the dirt and all the things that people do that are wrong and sinful. And it's sad to see that, to see things that come across your, you know, come across your face, things that come into your knowledge. I don't like it. And it's disappointing. And, and here's the thing that, that I like to do, and this is what I do with everyone that comes to our church. I always assume the best of everybody. I assume that everyone in this church is a better Christian than I am. That's how I like to view people. I, I know what my faults are and I know what my failures are. And I like to view everybody here as being like superstar Christian, just like awesome. And I believe that about everyone. And I don't want to be disappointed. Now look, I know that you're all sinners. I know that. I know that you're one of the things you struggle with. But I don't want to know particularly what they are unless you need help. Then I'll try to help you. But I, I, don't, I don't want everyone to come, you know, like, so-and-so's doing this and so-and-so's doing this. And, and, and you know what? We don't really have that problem in the church. I'm not saying we do. Thank God. <laughs> I like to just view people that way and, and and especially when it's the smaller things because what 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 good is it going to do for me to know that so and so does this sin or or what you know like whatever i'm not going to act on that that's not going to change anything in my life and anyone that i deal with or anything that i do so okay now i found out that someone has this sin in their life and they're wrong about something or whatever like okay there's no reason to now start talking to everyone else about that. Why? Why? Why do you do it? Why would you do it? I mean, and just think about that. Why? If you ever have to ask yourself, should I be talking about this? Well, what's the point? What's the point? What, 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 is, what am I going to do by, by saying this to this person? Think about that. Does it help anybody? Are you helping anyone with that? Are you, are you making justice be served? You know, in many cases, no. Verse 30 says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And malice is like ill intention, like bad intent against people. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And that mindset of forgiveness, of not being bitter, of being able to have uh, long-suffering, which God has for us, you know, we're, we're working for a common goal. And you know what we really ought to be caring about the most is, is our own church. Right? Let's focus on what we're doing here. We got a bunch of sinful people, and we got it, and we're trying to work together. And and gossiping and tailbearing and talking about things that, that people do, and this person did that, and that person did this sin, and this person did that sin. It's not gonna help anyone out, it's not gonna help out our cause, it's not gonna do anything like that. And if it's not something that actually needs to be addressed, then why talk about it? See, most of the time who it needs to be addressed with is that person themselves. So when someone, you find out someone's got a problem, then deal with that person. That's how you're going to love them and help them. Like in Leviticus 19, it said, love thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon them, right? So rebuke thy neighbor and you're going to love them as yourself, right? So you know someone has a problem in church or where, like whatever, your friend, then tell them that they're wrong and rebuke them and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Instead of telling everyone else about their problem and their sin. But, but be faithful like that. Because isn't that what you would want to have done for you? And I'll, and I'll close it on that too. Let's say you're doing something 
And for whatever reason, maybe you're blind, because people like to justify their own sin, don't they? That's real common. I don't know how many times I've sinned, especially in the past, I've, I've sinned, and I've just, I found a way of justifying it in my mind. And, and, and I thought I was okay. I didn't really want to hear any different. But I'd rather any sin I'm involved with that I'm trying to self-justify, someone finds out that, that I'm doing this, right? And it's something that I don't think is that big of a deal, maybe. But it is a sin, and I'm wrong, okay? Just setting the stage here. I would much rather have that person who knows that than finds out about that confront me and tell me why I'm wrong and why I'm justifying myself or whatever and just, and just come to me and tell you, then just have that person just like tell a whole bunch of other people that know me around, you know, and just, and just talk about that instead of just coming to me. Because then maybe later you come to realize like, wow, you know what, I was wrong about that. But then it's just like, th then you're kind of embarrassed and ashamed. Like, like, how could I have thought that way? That was stupid. But then it's like, now you've just published abroad this whole thing, what, what good does that do? And, and don't, don't cover your gossip by saying, we need to pray for so-and-so because I'm not kidding. That is a form of gossip. You know something that's, that's a serious matter for someone? Let them reveal that secret to people or ask them, hey, do you mind if I share this? And, and use some sense on those sensitive areas that you know something. And, and look, I'm all for praying for people that have problems and that are in sin. A hundred percent. But you don't just take it on yourself to start telling everybody their business if they haven't told their business to those people. You can say, can you please pray for this person? They're going through something. And leave it at that. But you don't need to be divulging the information about those people unless they consent to, to that. If they're okay with it, fine. And that's how you, how you have a faithful spirit. And you know what? That's how you're going to be a good friend. That's how you're going to be a good Christian to other people. And look, this is how we ought to be living. Don't, don't get caught up in the drama. Don't get caught up in the gossip when you hear this stuff. Don't participate. It's always going to be going around in the world. And, you know, God help you if you, if you get caught up in all the drama of the world, too. Like, <laughs> Who cares what these rock stars and movie stars, you know, and they're they, so-and-so, they cheated on them, and they're divorcing this person. You know, it's just kind of like, man, who cares? Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you much, so much for your word and for, and for the, the wisdom that you provide. I pray that... that it would be clear in our minds that we can have better wisdom, understanding, and discernment, Lord, on when, when it's appropriate to actually talk about things and when, when uh, certain pieces of information or knowledge comes to, to, to us that we can deal with things appropriately so that we're not, uh, we don't end up covering up the important issues and things that need to be dealt with and ought to be dealt with publicly, Lord, and that we wouldn't just do that because we're a respecter of persons especially, but... Um, also, that we wouldn't go the other direction and, and just start talking about things and being a, a respectful person that way either against somebody um, and just, just start slandering and, and uh, tail-bearing, Lord. I pray that you would please just help us to, um, to, have, to know the right balance to when it's appropriate to say something, when it's not, when we should be concealing a matter and be faithful um, with the secrets and, and when we ought to um, reveal those things because, because it is a serious issue, dear Lord. And I pray that you would help our hearts to be right and that we can uh, move forward in, in unity of the Spirit and, um, and do a good work for you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.